Good morning and welcome to, thank you, welcome to Hillman Baptist Church this morning. We are glad you are here to worship our Lord and Savior with us. If you would uh, stand with me and we'll begin praising the Lord with our voices this morning. We'll sing uh, 431 from the hymnal, Shine, Jesus, Shine. We'll do all three verses. being the light of the world and um, the light um, once we put our trust in him his light being in us and something that I hadn't um, hadn't really perceived or, or understood as um, as I was reading the first part of the book of John and talking about the light that says the light um, Jesus you know referring to Jesus as the light the light has overcome the darkness, and the more I thought about that, um, I did an illustration with the kids. Um, we turned turned all the lights off so that everything was dark, and told them uh, had um, one of my daughters turn on the light switch back there in the light, or I used my cell phone too as an example. 
the light overcame the darkness. And then what we could see again, we could see to move about and do things. And then I said, okay, now turn the darkness switch on. And they were like, darkness switch? There's no darkness switch. Um, and the point is that light, um, the light of Christ in us, overcomes the darkness of the world of sin and death. But as long as we don't hide that light, as long as we don't try to put it under a, hide it under a bushel, no. Um, as long as we let that light burn in us, darkness cannot overcome it. You, there isn't a switch for darkness. Okay, and I'd never thought about that. Light can overtake darkness. Darkness cannot over, overtake light. The only way that happens is if you extinguish the light. And there is no switch where somebody can come and flip it on and take away the light that is in you. Um, and so it was just something that, that I had never really perceived or understood in that way. So I hope the kids thought it was uh, kind of cool to, to have that. Anyway, Jesus is the light of the world. Let's pray before our next hymn. Heavenly Father, thank you for that light. We know that um, Jesus is the light of the world. He is the light that burns in us when we put our trust in him. Um, Father, and then we know that Jesus went on to say that now you are the light of the world. And we know that, that, that we in ourselves are not the light, but it's the light of Christ in us that makes us be that reflection, be that light that can show people um, the way to you in this dark world. Father, help us. I know we all at times have a tendency to want to pull back or um, to kind of hide that light in some way or, or um, um, uh, let, let the um, flame maybe kind of um, dim a little bit. Um, Lord, just give us, um, give us that desire to let your light shine bright in our lives, Father and um, to be the light that can help this world, that can show the love of God to people around us. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity just to be here, to worship you, to lift our voices to you, to um, hear um, of your work in the world, and to fellowship with each other. We just pray your blessing on all that we do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're using your hymns, number 575, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, we'll do all three verses, please. the way I always hear all the, the old Southern Gospel uh, groups singing it. So when I'm up here, I feel like I can't do that because that's the bottom line. I'm supposed to be singing the top line. So I want to hear, I don't care if you're, if you're a man or a woman, young, old, I want to hear that bottom line, okay? Leaning on Jesus, leaning, even if I'm the only one singing the top, I don't care. All right, let's try it. <clears throat>
third verse we had it pretty good. If we had four or five verses, we'd really be booming it. Okay. <laughs> All right, take a minute to say good morning to somebody you haven't seen yet today. Good morning, everyone. So a couple of things. I'm, I'm really here to talk about, ladies, this flyer that's in your bulletin insert. So while I mention two things prior to that, you can dig this out and look for it, okay? First, um, does anybody know Diana Molin, M-O-L-I-N? Does anybody know her? Please, I mean, maybe I know her if I see her, but I, I, don't, I don't know her. But, you know, she, she works at the One More Time, and she donates her time to women's ministry. And almost every month, we get $100 that goes into the women's ministry account. And that, that, that is just amazing, and it helps us so much. So... I do send her some things once in a while to let her know what we're doing or I invite her to events or something. But if you know her, please tell her that her contribution makes a difference. And we hope, the women's ministry team, we hope that she feels we're doing wise things because she's working for us. So I just wanted to say that. Also, also before I talk about woman to woman, heart to heart, um, April 29th, we're starting to work on our spring brunch already. The date will be Saturday, April 29th. We have a speaker lined up. Her name is Aminta Geisler. She's from the Twin Cities area. If anybody listens to podcasts, she has a podcast called Mint. M-I-N-T. Um, just 
incredibly good, I think, and I'm really excited that she's willing to journey up to our neck of the woods and share with us. So Aminta Geisler, check out her podcast, M-I-N-T. Oh, and guess where we get to hold it this year? Knife River Place, the new event center down the road. The Hepners are, are, uh, have reserved the date for us. That'll be exciting to see. It's a beautiful place. It, it'll just set a whole new tone. I mean, I love our church, but it's going to kind of step us up a little bit, it feels like. Okay, those are my two things. Now, Scott, I need you, Scott. I'm a little unsure how to pronounce the name of the town in Mexico where Ken and Leah are. And I don't, I don't want to say it incorrectly. So Scott's role in this is to give me the name, say the name of that town correctly. He didn't know I was going to do this, so hopefully he knows how to say it. I'm pretty sure he does. Well, it should be Rachel, probably. Um, I believe uh, it's uh, very close to Piedras Negras. Okay. Ah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Scott. So when Ken and Leah were here a few months ago, um, the women's team got a little inspired by the fact that we feel we should make a closer connection with the women from Hillman to the women down there that Ken and Leah are ministering to, specifically Leah and her team down there. So we've had some conversations back and forth, and we put together a plan. So if you pull this out, ladies, we're calling it woman to woman, heart to heart. And it's kind of a pen pal type thing, but we're going to, women's ministry is going to help facilitate this for you. So if you sign up to do this, your commitment, your minimum commitment is prayer for the lady that you get connected with in Mexico. And number two, your second commitment is four times a year, women's ministry is gonna pull you together and we'll collectively write some letters. We have some Spanish interpreters lined up to help. Rachel and hope, uh, Bev Johnson will help. I've got a couple other folks in the back seat to help too if we need help. We'll do a craft, we'll write a letter, we'll package everything up, and we'll send it down to the Spielers, Leah in Mexico, okay? So our first round of doing this will be October 28th, we're going to meet here at the church, 4.30 to 6.30. And to start us out, I have a form letter. It's already written in Spanish. You're just going to fill in the blanks. See, this isn't hard. Don't get intimidated by the Spanish, okay? Don't get intimidated by the language barrier. We can figure this out. There's technology. There's people. We can do this, okay? So we'll fill out this letter. You can write a separate little note if you want, and Rachel is going to be here. Bev will be here. They'll help interpret it. We'll also have Alicia from Desires of Our Heart Photography. She'll take photographs of all of us. Juanita is going to help us with our first craft so that we can make a little jewelry piece to send with our letter and with our picture. We'll package this all up, and we'll ship it down to Leah, and then we'll see what comes back to us. And we'll do this four times a year. Okay? Um, every change of season, we'll get together and do this. In the meantime, you know, when you learn who you're connected with, who your woman is, um, if you're both pretty finesse at technology, and if you have Facebook accounts, you can connect via Facebook. You can message, text message back and forth if you want to, but that's optional. The minimum is you pray for your woman, and you get together with us, in fellowship time, food will be provided four times a year, and we put our letters together and put a craft together, okay? So there is a sign-up sheet down there by the door. Um, you need to sign up soon because our first event, our first time together to get everything put together and have some pizza together and just enjoy our company is October 28th. Does anybody have any questions about that? Oh, thanks, Mary. Yeah, I, I think it'll be really fun, and let's see where this goes, okay? I'm excited about it. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I was a little hesitant uh, when she said, I need your help. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Um, I was, uh, if it had been Mrs. Hartfelt up here, I would have really been uh, <laughs> concerned. But uh, um, so, yeah, that's a great, great idea to put that together. Um, just a um, couple things. Um, Pastor Slavic would like to say thank you to the church for your prayers and support. Um, he is, um, his uh, original injury that he suffered at work has healed, and the um, infection that he had after that um, has also healed up now, so he has been able to return to, um, to work, or his second job other than being a pastor. Um, so he would just like to um, greet our church and say thank you for your prayers on his behalf. Um, and then I just want to remember um, Joe uh, and Leah who were uh, joined in marriage yesterday. And um, just please keep them in your prayers as they begin their life together and um, that they keep Christ at the center. Um, and um, from 25 years of um, marriage with Deline, um, I can say that um, that has been the most important element of our marriage is having Christ at the center because as we all know we don't always see eye to eye um, things come up but we always go back to Christ and um, what he means to to us as a family now she's making me cry <clears throat> it takes a lot to make me cry but, um, Anybody else, anything I'm forgetting that I was supposed to mention? I don't think so. All right, then we'll have our usherettes come forward and take our morning offering. Mrs. Kathy, could I ask you to pray for our offering this morning? You bet. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this church building where we can come to worship together, to worship you, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, Lord. Help us, like we talked about in Sunday school class, not to be whiners and grumblers, but to just see all the good that you've given us. Lord, we just ask now that you would bless the tithes and offerings that these people give back to you so that it can serve our community and those all around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. stand with me. We're going to sing a couple, um, I can say old songs because I remember them from when I was a child and I'm getting a little bit um, up there. So we're going to sing um, He Owns the Cattle and then three verses of I Have the Joy, Joy, Joy. And um, I just want to say briefly that sometimes um, when I sing that song I'm just thinking of joy of just being happy but what it really means um, when we put that joy down in our heart um, is that when life isn't always fun um, when we have days where we just as soon crawl back under the covers and lock the door um, and throw the phone away um, that because we have that joy that Christ can bring deep down in our hearts we can still say thank you Jesus Thank you, Lord, for...
for being there for me. She was a very unique woman, very special, very uh, dedicated. She was a lot of fun to have in my class. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing her. Uh, I'll be down there. Um, I have one more trip coming up, and so I'll be with you for a month. And then in November, I'm going to go down there and uh, teach another class. And so uh, looking forward to that. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a uh, story of my trip. I learned a long time ago when I go to Ukraine and teach, after several weeks of doing that and traveling home, I don't have the mental capacity to put together a sermon, let alone a couple of sentences. And so I've learned is that I just kind of do show and tell. And uh, so I had a good time. So uh, after this trip was only, well, it was about eight days. But when I got home on Wednesday after flying, I had a funeral Thursday morning. I had a funeral Friday morning. I had the wedding practice Friday night. I had the wedding all day Saturday. And so I thought this is going to be a great thing to do as well. So anyway, let me tell you about the latest trip. To uh, We actually, in eight days, we covered three countries. We landed in Poland, traveled into western Ukraine, and then toward the end of it, we traveled down to the neighboring country of Moldova. And uh, so anyway, some of the gentlemen you recognize on the far left, uh, Volodya, uh, he was with us uh, earlier this year, and so uh, he traveled as well. He had spent about uh, six weeks in the States and just had a great time. He loved his time here as well, but then recently he had been out in California. A good friend from Ukraine is now living in California, and so he's out in Sacramento. Anyway, his friend drives over the road semi, and so he says, sure, I'll go with you. So uh, he said, I drove from California to, Dallas, or to Denver twice, so he got to see a lot of the part of the country. So he uh, joined me as well. And then, of course, Ivan Ovcherenko, the second guy in, he was here last November. He is the director of the seminary in Kremenchuk, where I teach most of the time. And so he joined us as well. Then to uh, be my left would be Steph Steve Eckert. And uh, Betty knows him well. He was uh, one of Betty's pastors years ago when uh, they were younger. And so uh, Steve Eckert is the director of Reed Ministries. I serve on their board Reed Ministries provides theological resources to the Russian-speaking world. And what we do is that we raise money to underwrite 
seminary programs and then also books and that's the main reason why we did this trip we went to have a large pastors conference and a large book giveaway to pastors who are trying to serve their churches and then uh, uh, next to him would be uh, Alexander Zagalenko. He is the founder of the seminary. He's also the father-in-law to Ivan Ocherenko. And so, Alexander, I met him, uh, well, in 2002. Uh, he is the one who invited me to come to Ukraine in the first place, and so I've been teaching at his school. And then next to him would be his son, Andrew. Andrew is the uh, academic dean for the seminary. He's also in charge of all the books the thousands of books that we distribute. And a little bit later on, you're going to see a picture of a van full of books that, that we gave away. So anyway, the three of us, uh, we flew from Minneapolis to uh, Amsterdam, and from Amsterdam, we flew on to uh, Poland. And then when we traveled into Ukraine, then we met the other Ukrainians. And so here is our travel here. And so uh, had a long flight. And so this is my second time uh, this year of uh, traveling to Warsaw. And uh, when we were there, we just rested for one day, and we were met by this couple. And uh, this is Vova uh, and um, Oksana Bogomas is their name. And uh, they minister to a church in the city of Kemelnitsky, which is western Ukraine. Uh, Reed Ministry has a long history with uh, Vova. Uh, during the trip there, there's a PowerPoint. I saw him when he was a really young man. I barely even recognized him. He looked like a kid. And so he's had a long history, and he's been faithful. One of the things that Reed Ministry did, especially during the war, uh, we were able to raise large funds of money. And a lot of the Ukrainian pastors, the greatest means that they had to help their country was either transporting people out of a war zone or taking food back in. And so a lot of the pastors made requests of us, and so Reed Ministries purchased a number of large cargo vans to make that possible. And so right now, the, the classic vehicle in Ukraine now are these big, large cargo vans. You see them everywhere. And so, in fact, on the trip, I actually, in, I, I, I'm a partial owner now of a cargo van in Ukraine as well. I made a commitment as well. So anyway, uh, this couple, they were able to leave Ukraine to come to us. In the war, um, if you have three or more children, you're allowed to leave. You have less than three, you can't leave, okay? And so that's the rule. Now, they were going to come back anyway, and so because we had uh, purchased a van for them, which they had been faithfully using, they drove their van from Ukraine there, and uh, he told us that going to the checkpoint, it took him two hours to get through the checkpoint. Uh, we were very fortunate. It took us about an hour to get back through the other way. But one of my friends told me at the height of the war when everyone was leaving, he once was at the checkpoint for three days, before he could get out. And I told him, boy, you must have really wanted to see your wife. Because <laughs> he was in Poland. So anyway, uh, it was good to be. So we, we spent almost our entire time. Uh, they were our drivers. So this is the checkpoint. They told us no cameras. And so I took as close to pictures as I get before I got in trouble. And so anyway, we're, we're kind of going into no man's land. And so uh, we are leaving Poland and we're driving into Western Ukraine. And so when you get there, you first come to the Polish side. And so soldiers come, they want all your passports, you got to get out of your vehicle, they check your vehicle in and out and all that. And then after about a half an hour, you drive about 200 yards and the Ukrainians make you do it all over again. And so it's very, uh, uh, and then as we were driving toward, uh, we were driving toward the border, there had to be over five miles of semi after semi after semi heading from Poland with supplies into Western Ukraine. It, was just, it went on for miles. And so again, that's how Ukraine is getting supplies. Again, the Russians are kind of bogged down in the east, but they can't touch the west because if they do anything in Poland, then they get NATO and they don't want NATO. I mean, they're struggling with the Ukrainian army, let alone they don't want to mess with NATO. So anyway, there's very interesting crossing into the border and it was actually a joy to be back in there. So anyway, we had a 12-hour drive from Warsaw to that city called Kemelnitsky, which is in western Ukraine. It was about four hours to the border, an hour at the border, and then another uh, seven hours on. So basically it was all day long, but uh, it was fun to get into, uh, back into Ukraine. And uh, you could tell as soon as you're in Ukraine, there's a certain... Ukraine has a certain style or maybe a lack of style or whatever, but you could tell you're back in Ukraine. And so it was fun to get back in there and spend time. So we got to the city of Kemelnitsky. Uh, it's about a city of 275,000. Uh, we stayed at this hotel for the time that we were there. 
and had a good time. And then we just go out and have ventures each day as we were there. And so uh, we got to our hotel on Thursday, kind of rested. So then on Friday was kind of a work day. And so the first thing we did Friday morning, this was the van, is a cargo van. Again, we bought it for him, and it was just full top to bottom. There were over 100 boxes of books, and every box, I'll show you in a little bit, had two, had 20 really good theological resources in Russian for everyone who came to our conference. And it was just a joy to do that. And so we got to the church, and we just started hauling. We spent a couple hours just hauling box after box after box. And so uh, here's the picture. I had to prove that Steve actually does work, Betty. And so uh, Steve said, Dave, take my picture. And so I took a shot of him. And so, yeah, we were just, we were just walking in, our, you know, just loading up and all that. So when we got done, we had this huge stack of books. It went about four deep as well. And so uh, we stacked them all up and then uh, got ready for that. And so then the, the pastor's conference was going to be on Saturday. So this was Friday. And so uh, we went to do an outing. There is a very famous, this is an ancient fortress. Parts of this fortress go back to the 11th century. And you get a sense of age when you're over in Europe. And so the more modern parts of it are from the 17th century. But uh, we're in the city of Kamenets Podilsky. And um, there, uh, there's a natural kind of a peninsula. And in the ancient world, you're looking for protection. And there's up on a hill. And so they built this massive fortress that was protected. And so it actually began prior to even known as the Polish Empire. You had a group of people known as the Ruthenians. The Ruthenians actually started part of this as well. And then each uh, civilization that's come along has added to it. And so we spent the entire day just going through. It was just fascinating to go through that and read the history and hear about that as well. Um, in the middle of it, there's actually like a big well and it had like a, a gate over it. And if you were poor and you owed debt, they let you out during the day to earn money to pay your debt, but at night you had to go and crawl into that hole and they put the thing on and they lock you in. And so uh, we, uh, that was very interesting to do that as well. And it was interesting just kind of the way they treated each other back in the ancient world. And so we spent the whole day just walking through. There were tunnels and there were uh, like in all the towers they had uh, holes where you could shoot arrows out, you know, for the approaching army. And so we just had a really good time. And so uh, we took a group picture. Here's the, uh, the group of us together. Uh, Ivan is great at selfies. He's, he loves the selfie. And so anyway, we spent the day and just had a great time. Uh, for the most part, the weather was really beautiful over there. He actually didn't need to have a coat on. It was just very pleasant. And so well, that was Friday. Friday was just kind of a day of getting ready for the conference and then uh, doing a little bit of sightseeing. So Saturday came, and so uh, these, this is the stack of books. And again, the biggest need, when I was a young pastor and I began my ministry, if I was going to preach through the book of Philippians, I went on Amazon and I bought the four best commentaries on Philippians I could buy. Piece of cake. They don't have that luxury. Okay, and so that's part of what Reed Ministries' mission is. We are trying to identify what are good, sound theolo theological resources that have been translated, or we can have it translated, and then we buy them in bulk, and then we just give them away. That's a, that's a big part of our ministry. The other part of it is, is that we'll go to all these seminaries, and then we will underwrite some of the programs. If they want to start a program, we'll tell you, for the next two years, we'll underwrite the program. We'll pay it off. That way you can get it started. And so that's been a great ministry for us. And so if you look at the stack of books there, if you look at the stack on the left side, if you look closely at the top one there, if you could read Russian, it says David Moline. That's my commentary on Proverbs. And so it was fun to uh, uh, have my book uh, given away. On the uh, bottom stack on the right side, it is actually, um, it's a uh, commentary. And when it's called the Slavic Bible Commentary. And so what they did with Russian-speaking theologians, they wrote a commentary in every book Old and New Testament, and so it's a commentary in one. It came out about two years ago. It's been very popular. Again, a lot of, like, for example, I write from an American perspective, where it's better for them to have it from a Ukrainian or a Slavic perspective as well. And so anyway, that was one of the big book gives away as well. Also, if you remember Volodia, if you go up in that stack on the right side, the third book to the bottom there, that's uh, Volodia actually wrote a systematic theology as well. And so that was one of the books as well. So anyway, it was a great joy to have all these books. And so we got them all stacked up. And uh, we can have a big book away. So uh, we began the conference, and it was really well attended. Uh, it was nice to see all these people come out. 
uh, pastors and church leaders. And so anyway, uh, Steve Eckert uh, gave a report about Reed Ministries ministry, talked about our long history in the country of Ukraine and the other uh, Russian speaking as well. Uh, we have a history of over 20 years with a good track record, and so uh, Volodya was our translator. Uh, Steve had me come and uh, talk about my ministry at the seminary and also my, the writing of my commentary. And so uh, that was uh, nice to be able to talk there as well. And then, uh, so anyway, here is uh, kind of the crowd. And so we're in the church there in the uh, city of Yarmolinsky. And again, it was really well attended. Uh, pastors from the, there are two surrounding districts known as Oblast. And so those who were able to travel came. Uh, toward the end of the conference, one of the men came up to us, and he was in a neighboring Oblast. And he said, a lot of the pastors in my area wanted to come, but they had to work and they couldn't come. And said, could you do this type of conference in my area as well? And so uh, we had 100 boxes of books. We gave 60 away, so we had 40 left over. So we left them in that region. The Americans can't come back, but our trusted Ukrainian ones are going to do that. And so hopefully in a month or two, they will go to the neighboring oblast and do the same kind of conference and give out 40 more. And so we're excited to be able to supply that. So anyway, as the conference began, um, uh, Vlody and I were handing out to so, uh uh, we were going to have some seminars, and so Alexander Zagalenko was the main speaker, and so he gave a seminar on the pastor and his library. Again, I remember when I was a young pastor, 35 years ago now, I remember when I started out, I realized I no longer would have my seminary's library to go to. I knew I had to start building my library. And so uh, I began to do that, and so I would say probably the most, you know, you know, for those guys who uh, have other jobs and you have tools and all that, I view books as my tools. And so probably over the years, I have invested over $20,000 in my library. But I had the opportunity to do that, and I had the books to do that as well. My goal was every book of the Bible, I wanted four major commentaries in every book of the Bible as I would preach through that. And I needed systematic theology and things like that as well. And again, for these men, they don't have that. They don't have that luxury. And so what we're trying to do, we're trying to give them as many theological resources as we can. A number of years ago, when I was writing my commentaries on Psalms and then Proverbs, I came across an article written by a Ukrainian doctoral student. He wanted to write a thesis on what is the greatest need in the Russian-speaking church. And the result of talking to hundreds of pastors, he concluded the greatest need for these churches is good theological education and then theological works. And at the end of the article, he listed every commentary of the Bible, each book of the Bible, that was now available in the Russian-speaking language, and it was a pitifully short list. And so in that sense, my commentary on Psalms and my commentary on Proverbs are the only ones available. And so uh, that's why uh, the, the great need. So anyway, it was a great joy. So l l look, at the, look at the look of delight on their faces. Can you imagine getting 20 books for free, knowing that you never had this stuff before, and now you can do a study. You can enable your people to better understand the Word of God and things like that. And so that was the joy. It reminded me, back when I was a younger guy, I had a brother, Dan, who was going to seminary in Dallas. And Dallas is a huge uh, seminary. And for six years, as he was working on his doctorate, Karen and I, and we would go down there to visit. My brother worked in the bookstore, and therefore they gave him great discounts. And because I was his brother, they gave me discounts. And so for six years, I brought $1,000 on every trip I bought $1,000 worth of books. And so what I would do is like a kid in the candy store. We are going to be down there a whole week. So every day I'd go into work, and while he was working in the bookstore, I'm just slowly walking through, I think I want that book, and I think I want that book, and I think I want that book. And then at the end of the day, I'd have, a, in, in the back of the store, I had a stack, or I had stacks of books. The next day I'd come back and say, no, I think I, think I want this book instead. You know, like a kid in a, in a candy store. And then also, because it's such a large seminary, a lot of the guys start, but not a lot of people finish, and therefore they, then they want to sell off their library. And so, again, I would say that every year I came back with 80 books. And I can remember, like, you know, Cameron will tell you that, you know, I was like a little kid. I'd open this box and look what I got, and I'd put it on my shelf and put my stamp in it and all that kind of stuff. And that's what I thought when I saw those guys and I saw their faces. I thought of me as a young guy and how excited it was to have books. 
So again, to me, that is kind of one of the driving force. That's what Reed Ministry is all about. We're trying to give these men who are faithfully serving, give them the resources to know the Word of God better so their people can know the Word of God as well. In addition to that, we also do church libraries. And so one of the things we'll do, so let's say that a church would send a a young person, male or female, from the church, and they're going to have this person become a librarian. It's a two-year program. At the end of it, they are given an entire library that they take back to their church, and then they use it as a means of educating their people and for evangelism. And so books have been a great thing, and that all came from Alexander Zagalenko. So anyway, as we're, as we're working through it, we spent the day there. And so they got a, a nice, uh, they got a, the boxes and they also got the meal before they took off. And so it was just a real joy to spend the day with these people, to invest in their ministries, to let them know, hey, we care about you. And uh, we're going we're gonna to give you as many resources as possible. So uh, we spent five days or five hours with these people from start to finish. Uh, just had a great conference. And again, that's kind of Reed's ministry. Hopefully, as the war will start going down, we want to get back. We do a lot of those throughout the year, and that's just a big resource. So on Sunday, we came back. This is the outside of the church. And so this is the Yarmolinsky uh, Baptist Church in that city where uh, 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 Vova and his wife serve. And so we had a, a great day with them again. You see those white cube vans? They're everywhere. And very likely that Reed may have bought one of those, okay? And so we had a time. And so anyway, uh, we had fun. Uh, so they had a wonderful worship team. In fact, what I did, in fact, what I want you to do, I'm, I'm going to give you a clear picture, and then I, uh, I recorded one of the songs, but if you know anything about phones, you got to trim it. So I want to let you listen to the typical worship team, but I want you to close your eyes because it's, I had to trim it, so it's going to be blurry. It might hurt your eyes. So anyway, just listen to the, this group as they sing. picture was kind of comical about this church some churches have little kids who walk in and out this church had an elderly lady who walked in and out all the time she was kind of comical and so and and to walk out you walk out there's a side door so to the left there's a side door so I'm sitting in the in this uh, first row there and anyway part way through the service also as you're walking in they have kind of a PowerPoint of announcements and there's an announcement there there's a picture of a cell phone and then there's a red slash through that. And so I asked Steve Eckert, you know what that sign means? To Ukrainians, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Ukrainians don't have very good etiquette when it comes to phones. And the point is, phones ring all the time, and they answer them. Doesn't matter if they're in church or not. And especially among the babushkas, most of the babushkas are not, you know, they don't know technology. So one, they don't know how to shut their phone off in the first place, you know. All they know is how to answer it. And so anyway, this grandma, she was very comical. She had like a walking cane, and so, you know, she walked nice and slow. So she walked in and sat down, probably five minutes in the sermon, or service, she's up, and she's walking. She walks right in front of the worship team, you know, oblivious to them, and everyone just kind of said, that's who she is. She did it three times during the service. And at one point, Steve Eckert is sitting on the aisle, and she wanted to start talking to him right in the middle of the service, and he's trying to be polite and all that, like, would you please go sit down, that sort of thing as well. So she was very comical. So anyway, we found her entertaining. She was kind of the grandma babushka, or the uh, church babushka there, who uh, I think they just all kind of put up with her. And they, everyone just kind of smiles. And that's just what she does. So anyway, we need one of you to volunteer to be the church babushka, just to walk in and out. And we all, that's, you know, that's who they are. So, okay. Okay. We'll, we'll have an election at the annual meeting who will be the new babushka. Okay. So anyway, uh, so uh, uh, during the service there, uh, each of us got to preach. So I got to preach the first sermon. They had a second. So I'm wearing my Vishivanka shirt. And uh, so uh, uh, whenever I traveled over to Ukraine, uh, this is kind of the traditional Ukrainian dress shirt. Also, by wearing it, it means I don't have to wear a tie. 
and I don't have to wear a suit. And so anyway, did that. So we had a good time. I preached from uh, Psalm 13 and had a good time. And then uh, during that very special, uh, they actually had pastor appreciation uh, for their pastor. And uh, they're big into flowers. And then uh, he's holding a bag. Later in the day, we asked him, what was in the bag? He didn't know his wife took the bag. So he, was, he, was, he, he didn't even know what he got. And so his wife said, it's on a need-to-know basis, and he didn't need to know I think it was chocolates. And so anyway, but anyway, they honored their pastor, and they've been faithfully serving there. Again, he, he and his wife remind me of the typical Ukrainian pastor and wife who just faithfully serve, have to work other jobs, don't complain about it, are just on a base as well. So anyway, they were just a delight. Really enjoyed getting to know them. After I left, we became Facebook friends and sharing as well. After the service was over, uh, we went to their home, uh, they'd found a home that they were able to reconstruct, and they built this house, and we just had a, a lovely meal with them. And so if you look at the picture there, you'll see my two favorite Ukrainian foods. The salad is called the Greek salad. Love the Greek salad. It's got feta cheese in it. It is my favorite. And then you can't see into it with the bowl. Really good borscht. There's nothing better than a bowl of borscht with really good sour cream. And so we had a, a really delightful meal with them and really enjoyed them. I want to show you their family because it reminds me of one of the families. And that is, is that uh, they have a biological daughter. She's 18 years old. The boys are all adopted. They are two sets of brothers. And that's actually one of the ministries that Ukrainian Baptists have done. There are many orphans in the country of Ukraine. There's a lot of alcohol problems and drug problems and all that. And so their orphanage is just full of unwanted children. The state will care for them up to 18, and they just kick them out. And then they're on the street, and that's a real problem in Ukraine. And so a lot of Ukrainian Baptists are using adoption as a means of evangelism. And what helps is, is that um, because you do that, the state will also kind of underwrite part of it. And so uh, anyway, so uh, they first adopted the two boys on our left there. These are two brothers. Uh, their parents died from uh, drug problems. And so they took them in. And then the next two set came as well from a mother who simply abandoned and walked away from her kids, never to be found again. And so it was really fun just to see them. Uh, there's, there's a deep love for those children, and they've just taken them in. So, again, this is kind of a very typical Ukrainian family. A lot of pastors have done this, uh, just taking these unwanted children. And the point is now these kids get to hear the gospel. And they're going to have a lot better life than sitting in an orphanage or being with parents who can't control their lives and all that. And so, again, we just had a delightful time with the Bogomas family. They were really, really a, just a delight. They're the kind of people you want to invest in. And uh, so that was fun. One of my more shallow goals of this trip, I had to resupply my tea. And so I did. I may have gone a little excessive, but you can't run out of really good tea leaves. And so anyway... What happened is that every year I go, all I have to do is get about four boxes because I know I'm going to be coming back later and all that. Well, when, you know, those evil Russians, I can't keep me from my tea, you know. And so anyway, what happened was is that uh, I've tried, anyway, I like the Earl Grey and this is Achman brand and all that. Anyway, remember earlier when Julie was going to come? I got the bride, hey, Julia, buy me some of that good tea. Well, because of the war, they can't get that tea in their area. So, uh. so anyway, we're thinking, full of Volodya said, maybe Western Ukraine. And so anyway, we got to the city there. So one day, he said, let's go for a walk. We walked for about a half an hour. We found a grocery store. We walked in, and there it was. So I went a little excessive. I bought eight boxes, and then Yvonne didn't know. He went and bought me two more. So anyway, I got 10 uh, put away at home right now, so I'm thoroughly enjoying my tea. So that was fun to get there and get back to that. I tell you a story. Um, Sunday night, after a long day, uh, we wanted to go out. We had there was a pizza place there. As we're walking out of our hotel, all of our phones chirped, and it said "air raid warning for your area." I will admit that my chest tightened up. But in that sense, you're sitting duck. There are no bomb shelters. You don't know if or where a bomb will land. And as I was kind of watching the people around, as we walked out of the hotel, you could hear the air raid going. It was very eerie sound, you know. It's just blaring all the way through the town. What I realized, they have that every week. That's just a way of life for them now. They don't know, in fact, uh, Volodia, who was here, 
His son lives in Zaporosia. If you notice, Zaporosia got hit five days in a row. Every day, he's talking to his son, and one time he said, well, a bomb landed f- five minutes walking from my house. That's just a way of life now. So when they get to church, they'll ask each other, so any bombs land in your area this week? Just a common talk. So anyway, so we, we walk out of the hotel, and we're going to go eat. And so uh, we had a long walk to the restaurant. As we got there, the staff said, well, we're closed until the air raid is over. So we went and just found a park, and we walked for about two hours and came back, and the air raid was over. We had supper. We went about our life. But in that sense, it reminded me, and it, it, it helped me be much more appreciative and also more prayerful that a lot of our friends in Ukraine, that is just a normal day for them in living under what they're living. And so anyway, we, uh, we still enjoyed the pizza, but uh, it was very interesting to experience that. When our time came to an end, then we traveled from Kemelnitsky. We drove down to the neighboring country of Moldova. Moldova has a long history with Romania. I'd never been to Moldova before. The reason why we went is that we have a seminary down in Moldova that Reed also underwrites, and so we wanted to get down there. We just wanted to, we hadn't talked to them for a while. We wanted to kind of find out how they're doing. Is there any project we can help you with? And so we drove down there. When you leave Ukraine, again, Ukraine is vast farmland. Moldova is a lot like it. It's just that it changes. I want you to notice the 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 a lot of broad hills and valleys. Moldova is a beautiful country. I really enjoy driving. It's a very bumpy country. Now, I have a phone. I like to keep track of my steps on my phone. I sat in a van all day. When I got down to where we're going, my phone said I'd taken 14,000 steps. That's how bumpy the trip was. <laughs> I was in the back of it, bang, bang, bang. And so anyway, I got some really good credit on my steps the other day, and I never got out of the van. And so uh, it was just beautiful. Uh, so a lot of farmland, but it's more. And what I didn't realize about Moldova is that if you like wine, go to Moldova. They have thousands of acres of vineyards. It's just, I mean, it just went on and on. I didn't realize that. And yet when I got on the plane in Chisinau to fly from Moldova back to Warsaw to fly home, every person on the plane had, they had bottles of wine in their bags and all that. I think I was the only guy who didn't have any wine with them. And so, uh, but yeah, the, the vineyards, I saw some huge apple orchards as well. Um, this is a very typical scene, horse-drawn wagon. And so there were some farms that were large, like, like with big machinery and all that, and then there were some plots where mom and dad are working it, chopping down the corn, stacking the corn stalks and all that. And so parts of it are very backward as well. This is a very typical scene. These grandmas just sitting by the side of the road, either trying to sell their squash or whatever vegetables as well. I mean, you pass them all the time as well. And so it was a very thing. And then uh, you saw a lot of this, a lot of of crucifixes throughout there. I mean, they'd be out in the middle of nowhere. It'd be like, you know, you're driving from Mora up to Hillman, and there'd be this huge cross or crucifix sitting out in the middle of nowhere. And so, so, again, these are very typical scenes. You know, these big uh, uh, concrete uh, crosses, whatever. And so it's a religious country. But uh, anyway, just, anyway, we had a really good time. And the goal of this trip, we wanted to get to this seminary. This is called the University of Divine Grace. And it's been in existence for 27 years. Anyway, we had a really good visit with them. They've got about 150 students on campus. Most of the schools I teach at in Ukraine, they kind of come and go, whereas here, this is actually a year-round formal uh, college and seminary. So anyway, well, we met with the leadership there, had a really good visit with them. The young man in the middle there, his father is one of the founders of the seminary, and now he's taken over, and uh, so his name is Yuri. When we kind of got done with our business, uh, I just asked him, I said, uh, do you ever have visiting professors? Oh, we love visiting professors. And so anyway, I got a new gig. And so uh, anyway, I, I told him about my teaching, and Moldova would be a safe country to go to. I could easily get there as well. And so anyway...
that as a board we've raised money to do this type of thing and so um, Our church, sister church in Ukraine, um, actually in the early days of um, Reed Ministries, we were able to purchase a pastor's library that they had at that time um, back uh, prior to 2000 even, I think, maybe. Um, so Pastor Slavic has one of the uh, early models of the uh, libraries uh, that Pastor Dave has uh, been helping to support through Reed Ministries. So um, that's, he was, I know he was very appreciative to have that resource at that time. And um, again, as Pastor Dave says, um, it's become commonplace in Ukraine. Um, if something like bombings, uh, missile attacks and stuff can become commonplace, but as we all know, um, things like that can just, oh yeah, it's still going on, still going on, still going on. And I find out even in my own life, um, I still watch, try to catch up on the news and stuff. But um, then every once in a while, am, am I still praying for these people like I, like I was in the early uh, part of the war when it was just like so ominous, you know. And even in my life, it's kind of become commonplace. Like, oh yeah, the war's still going on. There's still people paying a price. There's still tragedy there. But um, I've become somewhat numb to it. Um, so I just want to, um, I was thinking of that as Pastor Dave was sharing. Um, please, um, please remember our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, especially. Um, that they would be safe, that they would continue to be able to serve in that country. And um, I firmly believe, as Pastor Dave said, that Ukraine will um, be victorious. And I believe there's going to be a huge, huge opportunity for ministry in Ukraine and that Ukraine will be able to go out into the Russian-speaking world again and just to be a, a hub of um, the light of Christ in that part of the world. So that's my hope and prayer, and I, I hope that Hillman will be able to continue to be a part of that ministry there as well. If you'd stand with me and we'll sing um, the first verse of 506, I'd rather 
have Jesus. Thank <laughs> you.